All right. So, yeah. Thanks, uh, everyone, for turning up for this uh, important panel discussion here uh, on this theme of uh, banning the teaching of ABA and related uh, techniques. So ABA stands for Applied Behavior Analysis. Um, this panel discussion is uh, facilitated by the Autistic Collaboration Trust, um, and it's been uh, done in collaboration with uh, Bruce Wenzel from uh, MSU University in the United States. And we have a whole number of international panelists lined up uh, that will contribute to this uh, interactive discussion. So we are starting here with uh, an introduction from Bruce uh, and then followed uh, by uh, a local perspective from Marie Manalili uh, from the Philippines. Um, and I'll comment from a, the perspective here in Aotearoa slash uh, New Zealand, um, where, and I think what we all have in common and also all the other panels that we'll see later, um, we share this concern as autistic people that um, our neurology is pathologized in um, many countries um, and uh, that this pathologization um, is even, well, not only tolerated, but actively encouraged and further cemented by practices such as applied behavior analysis. And then, of course, beyond teaching those practices, we also still have research that relates to these practices, right? To improve these practices, improve, of course, in quotes. Um, and so I think social progress is overdue and um, we need to um, make that strong um, trans, transdisciplinary intersectional connection also to the rainbow communities and, and their achievements in terms of uh, liberating themselves from the pathology paradigm and from conversion therapies. And here, what we're talking about is basically the same thing for uh, autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people. So um, this uh, panel discussion is also part of an ongoing series that um, the Autistic Collaboration Trust has been conducting over the last year, um, or it's possibly, I need to look it up, it's, it might be now going on for, for more than a year. Uh, leading up to various petitions in various countries uh, towards banning ABA. Um, so I think my big message here from a sort of international perspective of autistic collaboration is that over the last year I've seen and we've seen as a community, a very strong consensus and solidarity across autistic activists from all corners of uh, this planet to come together and uh, push back against these pathologizing practices. And I would like to thank all the panelists who are standing up to join this um, panel discussion here. Um, this is an extremely important topic. Uh, the more I think international consensus we can demonstrate, the more uh, we have a social license to push back against um, the um, discrimination um, and, and actually the state endorsed torture that is still happening um, in, the, in the name of science uh, and um, well-being even. Um, and yeah, where autistic people and neurodivergent people are at the receiving end, sadly. So that's probably enough of an introduction from my perspective. So I'll hand over to Bruce, who is had this wonderful idea of focusing on the specific theme of banning the teaching of ABA, which is, I think, a very gnarly topic that deserves a lot of attention. It's very timely. Thank you, uh, Bruce, for organizing. Yeah, thanks for collaborating with us. This is really awesome that on this, uh, you know, milestone of the uh, fifth anniversary of the International uh, Day of protest against ABA, we were able to come together and do this on sh short notice. So I thank Yorn and Marie and everyone else who 
um, is going to contribute to this discussion. Um, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Bruce Wenzel. I am a uh, graduate uh, assistant, uh, master's student in the Department of Sociology at MSU Mankato. And uh, I'm also the co-founder and president of the Neurodiversity Activists, a, a student-led organization at MSU Mankato. And uh, for me personally, the intersection between sociology and uh, the neurodiversity movement is uh, very clear, at least to me, especially considering that um, C. Wright Mills, who's known basically as the father of radical sociology um, and the author of The Sociological Imagination, he, um, in my view, uh, explicitly mandates the shift from the pathology paradigm to the neurodiversity paradigm, because in his book, he outlines how this uh, quality of mind, what he calls the sociological imagination, basically consists of the capacity to shift from one perspective to another. And the neurodiversity movement, of course, as we know, is basically the movement to shift from the pathology paradigm to the neurodiversity paradigm. And um, in my own experience uh, here at the university, when I first read um, Throw Away the Master's Tools, Nick Walker's foundational piece on the neurodiversity paradigm itself, um, I had this experience of basically re-examining my own life through the lens of the neurodiversity paradigm and um, discovered that the um, things I was experiencing were very much the similar sort of social patterns we see in other marginalized communities. I mean, uh, you know, for example, like the pathology paradigm fundamentally assumes that there is one normal uh, way for the mind to be configured into function. There's only one normal neurology which is just as discriminatory as assuming there's only one right sexuality. And the neurodiversity paradigm, uh, on the other hand, says that the, uh, that neurological diversity is a natural form of human diversity subject to the same societal dynamics as other forms of diversity. And with this in mind, I was able to, at least to my knowledge, I don't know if anyone else has done this, but from to my understanding, I was able to independently coin terms like uh, institutional neuralism and uh, neurological battle fatigue, which to me were the neurodiversity equivalents of institutional racism and uh, racial battle fatigue, which of course occurs in universities across the U.S. and around the world, where it's you know systemic discrimination against ethnic minorities and. In trying to cope with that, they burn out. They are drained of their physical, emotional, and psychological capacities to even just survive, much less do homework. So one of the components of that systemic discrimination, that institutional um, oppression of neural minorities is teaching ABA as part of the campus curriculums. And I've basically spent the last four, four or five months, basically the whole summer and the early spring since finals week launching a counter assault on the ABA industry. And that is consisted of me making our move on petition to ban it in the state of Minnesota, um, meeting with local politicians like Senator Nick Frentz and Representative Luke Frederick and uh, Representative Jeff Brand and even uh, getting in touch with Senator Scott Dibble, who was pushing for a Senate bill to ban conversion therapy for queer people, the rainbow communities here in Minnesota, and um, meeting with student government and so on and so forth to um, get the message across to people that um, conversion therapy for LGBTQIA plus people is just ABA applied to gender, sexual, and romantic minorities. And 
conversion therapy for autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people is just ABA applied to neuro minorities. Because of course, um, ABA was invented by the UCLA psychologist, uh, Dr. Ovi Varlova in 1961. Um, here in UCLA, Calif uh, in the California and United States, and um, uh, he used it first to try to convert autistic kids into neurotypical kids. And then 10 years later, he helped co-found the Feminine Boy Project, um, which was basically the genesis of gay conversion therapy here in the States. So um, I guess basically to sum up, I've been going at the um, contradiction of our university, which uh, MSU's motto is big ideas, real world thinking, but and yet their curriculums do not reflect the really existing diversity of human brains and embodied minds. Um, it, it goes deeper than just teaching ABA. There are gen ed classes where, for example, in biology, they you know, have entire lectures talking about autism and other neurocognitive styles from a very pathological um, viewpoint. And, um, uh, even things like in the mass media here in the US, there are movies that uh, perpetuate those stereotypes and viewpoints. So um, I'm hoping to continue to pull on the levers that I have access to in order to uh, achieve some victories here with the resources that are available to us. Um, I hope that's a sufficient introduction, Jorn. Uh, I think uh, if there's nothing else you think I can add, I guess I'll, I'll yield to uh, the next speaker. Yeah, thank you, Bruce, for this uh, brief introduction. I think that sets the scene for us. Um, so Marie, you're welcome to, um, yeah, present your perspective. And I know that you've also uh, got a lot of uh, well, transcultural uh, experiences, right? Uh, both in the Philippines and uh, overseas. Um, and I think it will be very interesting if you can comment from, from your perspective, because um, I think what's really important here is to broaden the uh, perspective beyond um, the US uh, perspective on ADIA and uh, psychology and these Western uh, disciplines that uh, are basically, I think, imposed nearly on the entire world these days. And uh, I think I really welcome your perspective to comment and talk about those who find themselves at the receiving end um, or various forms of um, oppression and domination, um, not limited to being oppressed as an autistic person. So. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me and um, organizing this, Bruce and Bjorn. Uh, so, um, so I'm Marie. I'm a, I'm from the Philippines. I'm Tagalog, and um, I'm a late identified autistic. Uh, so it wasn't. Uh, and I'm, I'm also a speech uh, experienced speech and language therapist. I trained in the Philippines for and practiced for seven years before um, going into grad school to UC, UCL in London and City University of uh, London. Um, so I'm still on that and uh, wrapping up my master's thesis now. Um, so yeah, with, with respect to um, uh, my, my my experiences, it, it's a long story, but I'm going to try to um, give some uh, outline it here. Uh, so um, it, it wasn't, yeah, so so ABA, it, it's not taught here it, it, as a formal course in universities here in the Philippines, but uh, upon reflection and uh, my, my reflection about how if the, the speech and language therapy course and other allied health professions here in the Philippines, uh, how my clinical training and how the practices of um, uh, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, 
uh, here in the Philippines, there are some um, ABA components like um, negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement that are uh, embedded, and that's um, that's what that's how we get thought about how to manage behavior, which is I think has roots with, um, from Skinner's behaviorism and ties to ABA. But there are also ABA therapists here that um, they don't have licensure or anything, but they train from the US and then um, brought ABA here. And there are, and with, with the professionals and centers that I work with, they would uh, refer autistic kids, um, my uh, autistic students to ABA therapists. So there's, they have this, uh, we have this, um, acknowledgement that ABA is needed. And that's because um, the healthcare system and the education system of the Philippines was patterned after the US because US has so long influenced us because they because of US imp imperialism on us. So yeah, so it ties to colonialism. So going back to the the how ABA was born and then transferred to the Philippines because we were a colony. But still, is a colony right now, even if we're independent. But you know the the insidious forces of U.S. imperialism is hard to fight here. Uh, so yeah, that's how ABA came here. And um, and when I was still practicing, I haven't been back in practice yet because I'm busy um, studying still. Uh, I would get uh, um, I would. Uh, see uh, students, autistic students who get referred to me and they're also having ABA therapy elsewhere. And uh, sometimes these kids uh, uh, like have ABA therapy first before coming to me. And then when I see them, they, they just, they're just lethargic and just uh, there's something happening that, that shouldn't be. Like it's like it, it's hard, it, but during times when during that particular day, I, I would ask if they had maybe therapy or something else. There, there's a change. Like I feel like they 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 breathe more if they they don't have ABA therapy, and because these um therapies tend to be every day and day long, which is very taxing on anyone. <laughs> Really, uh, I think it's it's not right, but because it's prescribed by the pediatrician, the development pediatrician, and, and the research in the research on autism endorses ABA. That's what the parents opt for, and even the parents are convinced and um, would want to train as ABA therapists themselves, which they get from elsewhere, like Hong Kong, or because the ABA International is so big and very industrialized. And they actually believe that it's the only therapy that works for their autistic kids. And that's disheartening for me. Uh, but of course, back then I didn't know much uh, really. I, I've only been uh, exposed to autistic activists, the neurodiversity movement, when um, I started grad school and um, go going to London. Um, yeah, so so now going to London, um, UCL, uh, uh, it, uh, in my master there uh, is on is within the Institute of Education, and we have this module on inclusive, special and inclusive education, which is just not inclusive for me <laughs> as a person of color, and then late identified autistic. So uh, imagine the um, the irony of calling themselves as inclusive educators and yet I didn't feel uh, included because and then the whole time for the all the sessions that I have for that module I didn't talk at all because I just have this sense that uh what are what are you standing for really like um you you teach us about the history of special education and how you oppose eugenics and um but I, I I don't understand what what your whether and neurodiversity wasn't taught. Um, uh, they do um, 
they they do teach us about whether it's good to use person first language or identity first identity first language but um i don't feel as though they're they're um really acknowledging the neurodiversity movement or the autistic perspectives uh, there's still this authoritarian pedagogy that they they should be the authorities of how to educate um disabled people or uh, neurodivergent people and uh, again uh, they, I, they didn't teach me neurodiversity or anything about it i i just had to learn uh, for myself and then i wrote my essay about it uh, which um, was initially rejected, but I published it anyway. So, yeah. So, uh, it's about how how ableist ideologies stifle neurodiversity and inclusive education. So that's the the traumatic and sad part of my experience in the UK, uh, because my institutional affiliations, um, my official agenda there didn't really teach me what I'm what I came there for, but what I learned mostly it was from the autistic community there in the UK, the US, uh, and etc. So, um, which is, uh, I, I know it's changing now, but um, there there needs more structural, structural and systemic support. It needs to come from within, and uh, I'm trying to be part of that, and I know most autistic ad academics, neurodivergent academics are, are doing this, and, and right now we're, we're writing a letter to cognitive science, which is um, which was born in the U.S. as well, so it's an international um, scientific society for cognitive science that is known for um, explicit, explicitly rejecting. Um, they they started a cognitive revolution that explicitly rejected behaviorism, Skinner's behaviorism, which is good, right? But they haven't engaged yet with the neurodiversity movement. So that's the letter that we're, we're writing, like like how cognitive science can do better as a science if it engages with neurodiversity. Uh, um, because they are in a position to better reject the behaviorist um, der derivations of Skinner's behaviorism, like ABA, because we're supposed to be the enlightened one in, uh, in rejecting behaviorism. And yet they... They haven't done so yet so that's that's kind of my part of um uh like one of the ways i think would be valuable or instrumental in driving change and how to change uh how to stop or ban the teaching of aba but then the, uh, because some um, applied professions like this in universities do borrow um, theories and evidence from sciences uh, like cognitive science, psychology. Uh, so if the basic sciences, basic sciences that they draw on dramatically changes and embraces neurodiversity, I think it's it, it, it's, it will be not easier. It will help better drive away this garbage uh, uh, theories and practices. So that's, sorry, sorry if I'm rambling <laughs> because, yeah. So I do hope this helps or somehow, yeah. So it's due tomorrow and um, I hope to involve more and make, uh, we have this neurodiversity discussion group and um, and I'm at, um, in, um, I'm always collaborating. I, I want more collaborations with the Autistic Collaboration Trust. Uh, and I'm also part of the autistic.com community started by Diane J. J. Wright. And we're really um, focusing on autistic people of color there. Uh, and then I'm also part of the neurodiverse, uh, Narratives of Neurodiversity Network. So focus on creatives and um, academics. Uh, so so yeah, I'm, I'm part of many of these um, uh, activist um, uh, networks, and I hope to collaborate with you, all of you, and the, the other panelists uh, in this discussion as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Marie, for for your um, perspective there. Um, 
that's uh, very, very valuable. Um, and I've jotted down a few notes here that are interesting and I think common themes that are maybe worthwhile just um, uh, reiterating for, for viewers who may not be autistic themselves or may not be familiar with the you know, diversity movement. So um, uh, one term that I think came up uh, in the discussion was management of behavior. I mean, this is very interesting, right? That this is even a desirable goal. It, uh, because management of behavior, what is this? It's uh, someone basically comes up with standards of behavior and then those are enforced. This is what I call hypernormative. It's all to do with social power gradients. And uh, of course, I think Bruce, uh, with your focus on sociology, you are sensitized to these power gradients, right? And um, yeah, you can look at um, this entire topic from all kinds of angles, from different levels of um, abstraction, different levels of scale, uh, different sort of historical time scales. I mean, I must say, um, I've learned a lot by focusing on an anthropological uh, perspective, because I think autistic people, the way our neurology works is we are anthropologists by birth, right? And um, and then I've had the privilege of growing up in a range of different cultures. So I was born in Germany and then grew up in uh, Nigeria and, and Pakistan and then in Belgium. Um, and I've then lived in for a large part of my life now in the, well, in the remote former colonies of the British Empire, so uh, uh, Terror and uh, Australia, um, and if you think about it, you know, also uh, Nigeria and uh, Pakistan are all former British colonies, right? So um, I I know how the I mean, of course, from the perspective of a privileged, you know, white kid, um, I know um, how how those. Uh, I've seen these places and how the Western perspective has been imposed on them. And I mean, when I grew up in Nigeria and Pakistan, I was in the post-colonial period. So in Nigeria, I was a, a five to 10 year old kid um, growing up just five years after they gained independence. And it was very obvious to see all these uh, British and other European expats there. Um, basically perpetuating um, their superiority uh, under a new umbrella of uh, post-colonialism. Um, and because I've seen all these different cultures, well, I, I only discovered I was autistic fairly late in the piece because I was never at home anywhere, right? So, <laughs> and it just seemed normal to uh, have uh, all kinds of uh, uh, very different people uh, around. What I did notice is that, of course, neonormative people have very strong group identities um, in, and sometimes a very low tolerance for diversity. Um, now, coming back here to our topic. Um, so, yeah, management of behavior, I think, is problematic even as a goal. Um, my other interest beyond anthropology is um, language. Um, and uh, so my background is in mathematics. So I think about languages in very formal terms. Uh, and so there, there, when you then look it into the realm of psychology and psychiatry, you can't help but notice the uh, perverse uh, role of the, the diagnostic and statistical uh, manual for mental disorders, right? I mean, the name of this thing already is is appalling. Um, I mean, I think over the last week I've come up for a new acronym. It's, uh, I think going forward, I'm go going to call this thing uh, the devil's uh, sadistical manual, right? Um, because uh, that's closer to the, the truth here uh, in the way that it's being handled as the as the Bible, yet any serious academic these, these days has to admit that the DSM is a hodgepodge, uh, a collection of 
um, what uh, psychiatrists who get together in small groups discuss and they come up with labels for things that they consider pathological based on their own cultural bias. So uh, the DSM is a product of um, Western industrialized societies. It's uh, far from uh, culturally neutral. And the language in the DSM, I mean, tells you everything that you need to know. Um, and the fact that this language, that people still swallow this language, that we've got entire cohorts of psychologists and psychiatrists, uh, yeah, swallowing this uh, hook, line, and sinker is just speaks to the hypernormativity of our society. And it also speaks, I think, to the extreme um, cultural significance of that autistic people have always had in human society is because we notice this indoctrination that is happening. We uh, see it every time where, when it happens, where it happens. And we then speak up against this bias that uh, neonormative people often are incapable of uh, perceiving because uh, they um, don't um, think enough, uh, they learn too much by imitation. Um, so you can't even blame them for that. It's how they are wired. So I've been thinking about what leverage points we have to actually affect change. So this gets us to the question of how do we get to this goal of banning the teaching of ABI? And um, I mean, here in our Aotearoa, ABA, like in many countries, is still being taught at multiple universities. Uh, an interesting anecdote, a few years ago here, some of the key people involved in um, these faculties where uh, ABA is being taught, some of the same people have been embroiled in uh, highly pro problematic, uh, highly problematic discourse where an article had been published in a local um, paper, uh, basically um, dismissing Mari. Uh, um, approaches to, to knowledge uh, and Māori Ma uh, systems of understanding the world as unscientific. Um, so those are the same people, uh, right? I mean, who then uh, teach uh, behaviorism. I mean, it's sort of not surprising. Um, so in terms of leverage points, what am I personally focusing on? Um, end of last year, I came across uh, a course uh, for physicians uh, on autism. And, and that's a course that's being taught to uh, GPs, pediatricians, and other healthcare professionals to allow them to conduct pre-diagnostic assessments. And so I was curious. I wanted to know what these people are currently being taught. Um, I took this to our online course, and this is about as much as the average physician if they're lucky, learns about autistic people um, as part of their entire, you know, seven year plus education. Just think about that for a moment, right? At most, maybe two hours <laughs> over the course of seven years. And what I found was shocking. It's, yeah, straight out of the DSM, the pathologizing language. Um, and new diversity was mentioned as a side note on the last page. And I've now got the certificate. I took the course, right? So I'm now qualified to pathologize and uh, hand over uh, traumatized uh, people to diagnosticians. But I'm telling this anecdote here because I think it's imp an important leverage point where things are currently going fundamentally wrong because it's GPs and pediatricians where parents often first encounter the concept of autistic people. It's not even introduced to them as autistic people or autistic neurology. It's introduced to them as uh, autism spectrum disorder. You may have a child that uh, is affected by autism, right? And, and then the entire neurology is explained in terms of deficits, uh, not meeting milestones, it, developmental milestones. Now, add to this that we're living in a hypernormative society that's based on individual competition. So uh, parents walk out of these uh, sessions where someone alerts them to the fact that their child might be autistic in a highly alarmed state. They're ready to be, they're basically groomed to be fed into the autism industrial complex. 
And this is, I think, a very important message that everyone needs to understand. And it's this leverage point that I'm currently focusing on. So over the last year, we've developed an extensive um, educational program around uh, the neurodiversity paradigm, the neurodiversity movement, and artistic culture. So those are three very important topics that are not currently part of any um, educational course uh, that is available to physicians um, because they live in the medicalized paradigm, because the entire broad, so we don't only have a problem in the discipline of psychology and psychiatry, it's in medicine in a broader context where uh, very archaic uh, structures and disciplines and specialities are in place where people are trained uh, to think in silos. I'll now quote a physician um, that um, I've, yeah, is a physician that I highly respect and that we're collaborating with, who uh, just told me about their experience of being educated as a physician. Um, and effectively, um, I was hearing, yeah, imagination is beaten out of us as part of our education. So this is what medicine does to people because it's an established system of silos. People are hyper-specialized and that's how they create professions and how money is being made in all those countries where healthcare is not a public good, but a profit-driven industry like everything else. Um, so I'm trying to paint the transdisciplinary picture here to just uh, broaden the scope uh, or to open the scope of what we actually need to discuss here. Now, on a positive note, uh, yeah, there are more and more networks of autistic people that have come together and that are consolidating. So there's the Autism Stigma Research Group or network, um, which uh, tries to influence the language that is being used in psychiatry, uh, driven from the bottom up, so from the language that our community speaks, right, so that this language starts entering. Um, I mean, it's, but these are baby steps, right, to get this improved in course language into things like the DSM. I mean, the fact that we still have the DSM is actually the problem, right, but we need to, I think, also work on different time scales in parallel. So we need to sort of, uh, minimize the damage that is currently being done and imposed on autistic children. At the same time, you need to think longer term or get rid of the entire DSM, which is not going to happen overnight. Um, then there is the uh, Global Autistic Task Force on Autism Research, where we're pushing back against uh, damaging research agendas and better research designs. So I think the other, yeah, in terms of scope, I think we need to look at the teaching of current practices, but then also uh, what is being researched, what is gets through the sort of uh, ethical criteria for research. And I mean, the ethical standards are well close to zero in many places, right? It's box ticking. So um, I guess that sort of sums up, you know, some fundamental concerns that I have. So. Um, and maybe one question to start then is, given the current state of academia is, and the quality of autism research is so low, uh, so we're talk now talking something even beyond ABA, what chance, so here I'm opening this challenging question, what chance do we have to um, influence and actually radically change established institutions and faculties uh, to affect paradigmatic change. Is this the right approach or do we need to do something else? So if we think about, you know, Buckminster Fuller's timeless observation that you don't fight the established system, you create a new system that makes the old system obsolete. Or you can also um, look at, you know, what Thomas Kuhn um, articulated uh, in earlier times, right? That a paradigm dies basically with its last adherent, right? So um, new normative people uh, are resistant to paradigmatic change. So that's a huge challenge I think that we're facing. And I'm interested in looking into the how question. I'm just opening the floor. So I don't pretend to have the answers. Is there anyone who wants to go first answering to try to answer that question? 
Um, I guess I'll go first. Is that okay? Yeah, go, go for it. Um, well, as I had mentioned earlier, the, the um, with uh, local with state elections coming up here in Minnesota in November, um, the um, the issue of banning uh, conversion therapy, all forms of conversion therapy, has been on my radar uh, from the get go, really, and that's something that um, I saw a window of opportunity and 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 basically leapt leapt through it where for example back in um may um towards the end of the uh the legislative session here in minnesota um the the state senator from minneapolis uh scott dibble was trying to push a bill to ban a conversion uh, um medical assistance coverage for conversion therapy for uh queer people and uh, at first I was um, trying to get in touch with politicians to say you know why not amend this bill to include ABA since conversion therapy for queer people stems from ABA and of course you know there's conversion therapy for autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people that stems from ABA and the unfortunately the session um, had ended and then the um, it did get that that bill did get a majority support but it wasn't enough to pass it through and get it signed by the governor so what I've perceived as a solution is in writing our petition to uh, ban all forms of conversion therapy in Minnesota I detail in there that um, we have to create the conditions to even accomplish that. And one of those prerequisites is to um, mobilize, to unite, organize, and mobilize the autistic and queer communities um, to, you know, have a, to, to turn out in large numbers in November to vote and flip the Senate because it's currently very conservative controlled so that you have enough people to um, not only propose a bill, but pass it to get to the governor's desk and then sign it. Um, so that's more on a state level. And to, for me on a local level, I had recently visited the student government on campus and gave them the basically like the five minute rundown on um, the the need to transition from the pathology paradigm to the neurodiversity paradigm um, regarding the campus curriculum, particularly banning ABA. And um, right after the student government had adjourned, I immediately got multiple people coming up to me, basically giving me endorsements and saying, you should run for the uh, graduate studies senator vacancy. And so I'm looking forward to pursuing that and getting in there and influencing policies in the university and meeting with deans who are allied with the movement and from there meeting with administrators in other universities across the state. And, you know, starting from, you know, inside out as Marie was saying. And um, I think, a, you know, the long term goal that, you know, Yorn had alluded to for me, at least at the university, um, is to do, and I love the fact that you quoted Buckminster Fuller, because that's something that I had tweeted out recently that Nick Walker had liked very much. It's a favorite quote of mine where, yeah, we're, you know, what we're basically um, going for is transforming these institutions from what she calls um, neuro-provincial, you know, neuro-normative institutions to uh, neuro-cosmopolitan institutions where different neurocognitive styles are embraced just as different you know, ethnic identities or sexualities are embraced. And um, uh, it's especially, 
important, I think, to leverage the local histories of oppression in other communities to um, to to get people to get it because you know that's difficult when it's an unrecognized form of oppression um, and in my hometown here in Mankato, Minnesota, um, we're famous for one of the most atrocious things in U.S. history. We, um, back in the, the mid 1800s, uh, during like the Civil War era, um, the, the city of Mankato, under the you know orders of President Lincoln, hung, I think, 38 Dakota men in the largest mass execution in U.S. history, and the uh, indigenous autistic author uh, Jules Edwards, who goes by autistic typing on social media, she had uh, written an article where she flat out said that applied behavior analysis is forced um, assimilation reminiscent of the boarding school era for indigenous people. So the, the message that I've been bringing to people because there is a strong um, history of indigenous oppression in Mankato. And then there's also the um, Pride Fest coming up in September in about just over a week or so is to, you know, bring up those comparisons and say, you may not recognize the oppression of neuro minorities now, but you didn't always recognize it for these other communities either. And this thing that's going on now, you know, five, 10 years from now, you'll look back on this and go, oh my gosh, how could we have been so prejudiced and not recognize this? And um, again, it even, some of these things are just so fundamentally flawed. Like the thing I, another comparison I bring up to people, for example, like with the special education programs, uh, special education is just segregation because, I mean, what does it do? I mean, one, it pathologizes neuro minorities. It says that they have a mental disorder. Secondly, it separates them from their neurotypical peers. And if the black civil rights movement in the sixties in America taught us anything, it's that there is no such thing as separate but equal. And then thirdly, when they're in there, these services that they give them um, are behaviorist. So they're just pathologizing neurodivergent kids, separating them from their neurotypical peers, and then putting them through a form of conversion therapy. And then they mask it in various ways where sometimes it's not called ABA, it's called PBIS, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, or EIBI, Early Intensive Behavioral Interventions, or sometimes they just call it social skills training. And a thing that I was telling a podcast host recently was that you basically have to be, I mean, for us, it's very obvious what's wrong because these are things we've had to live through our whole lives and endure. And so like we were able to recognize those red flags, like, oh, this professor is a BCBA. Um, but you, you basically have to um, be your own amateur sleuth, like your own independent investigator and, you know, pull on that thread and, you know, kind of, um, you know, be the uh, canaries in the coal mine and whatnot. I mean, Yorn, I love what you wrote on uh, the Ot Club website where you had said that um, uh, autistic people are best understood as the uh, agents of a well-functioning cultural immune system within human society. I mean, that is precisely, that encapsulates my own lived experience so well. I mean, in every situation I've been in, I just get backlash for standing up for something. And um, here, especially in America, there's, you know, um, the presence of Autism Speaks lobbying governments and, you know, pouring money into terrible things. And uh, um, sometimes it's just, you know, 
the thing that will um, register with someone isn't always, you know, giving them the history on who Ivar Lovas is and all these corrupt things or the DSM. It's some, sometimes it's just as simple as telling them, hey, did you know that um, uh, Autism Speaks was, first of all, they don't speak for us. It should be called Autistophobia Speaks. And secondly, it was founded by the former CEO of NBC and an executive for General Electric after he found out that his autist, that his grandson was autistic. And then he made this organization with, which, with his rich pals to cure autism, uh, which is in, just as impossible as curing homosexuality. And then, you know, hired a Hollywood director like Alfonso Cuaron, who directed uh, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban to make an autistophobic uh, propaganda film that framed us as a disease worse than cancer. And it's like, we're not the disease, we're not the illness, um, our culture is. Like capitalism is the illness, not autism. Um, and with that, I mean, um, Minorities have been pathologized to justify other minorities. Uh, other minority groups have been uh, pathologized to justify social hierarchies under capitalism for as long as capitalism has been around. I mean, that's what they did with, you know, scientific racism uh, and such. So um, that's basically my info dump version answer <laughs> of uh, Figure out, you. You know, just unpacking all of that. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. This is, I think, spot on. Um, and I like how you conclude with this um, radical critique of the system that we all find ourselves in. Um, I think this is something that um, society at large still has to really understand. I mean, or just a really anecdote. I mean, this is now from over five years ago. I remember, you know, yeah, maybe it's seven years ago even. But I just for, so those were the days where you had many less openly autistic people, right? So most of the discussions was going on in anonymous formats and online groups. Um, and so just for the fun of it, I conducted an uh, online straw poll, right? On um, amongst autistic people, how they relate to any kind of sort of hierarchical uh, systems of organization. I mean, if you were to take those numbers, um, well, over 40% of autistic people are radical anarchists, right? Um, you, I would suggest you conduct that type of poll in the general population, I think the answer would be very different. So. There you have some, you know, it's not a scientific kind of proof, but it's, and by the way, the, the remaining 60% of autistic people, I mean, I would argue, you know, there's a lot of internalized ableism within our community, right? So I think in terms of our disposition, well, we are clearly very sensitized to these systems of power and we suffer and we oppose them, not because I think because we physically suffer the effects. Um, if we attempt to conform, we actually suffer not only in terms of mental health, but also physical health. And um, so I'll just throw in another interesting connection, um, this intersection between being autistic and being traumatized, right? If you look at the diagnostic criteria and the descriptions, um, Traumatized the behavior of traumatized people is very similar in many ways to the behavior of autistic people. So you could say probably 80% of the um, diagnostic criteria that are being used for autistic people um, uh, talk about effectively behaviors exhibited by highly traumatized people. So what does that tell us, right? So my, I think it tells us that autistic people are simply, well, we've got a different our perception works differently. We are um, hypersensitive um, in terms of how we process things um, and um, as a baseline, and that um, opens us 
to uh, being highly traumatized. And then surprise, surprise, we have these uh, traumatized behaviors. Now, um, we should look in terms of then um, supporting autistic people and including them, we should look at well, how do you deal with highly traumatized people? What do you have to do to prevent this level of traumatization? And then if you have these people, how do they need to be supported, right? And the answer is the opposite of what ABA is doing. Um, so Marie, now I think uh, you have the, yeah, you should have the last segment here so you can build on everything that's being said. Yeah, yeah, those are great points. And I'm sorry it's raining very hard here now and you can hear thunder, I don't know. So sorry about that. Um, in contrast to my background, which is sunny, but it's it started raining here now. Um, uh, so yeah, um, to me, that's a very tough question and something that we should think about really, how like we, we, are, we are all living in these toxic systems and and to me, uh, I thought I I I I, I, I re before like um when I, I I sunk into deep depression. I'm still managing it now because of the ableist and racist foundations of speech and language therapy and the medical sector, the education sector, as made clear to me <laughs> back in the UK as well, and how it ties to the history the history in the US and what's happening there because how everything is interdependent because of capitalism, imperialism, uh, and that, and those bad isms. So, uh, so when I was still like, uh, when, sorry. Oops. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I thought, um, I, I wanted to quit as a speech and language therapist already. I don't want to do this anymore. Like, burn everything down and stuff like that but but then uh, I, I had a chance to heal uh, and engage with other fields like cognitive science uh, um, uh, so ones that are away from my practitioner backgrounds and learning the root of these things and how these develop alongside each other but never really intersecting uh, so I, that gave me an opportunity to find better links and uh, get in touch with um, the neurodiversity movement or divergent activists like you, like you folks and academics as well, um, in the US, UK, and everywhere really, which is great that I met a lot of activists out there. But um, uh, so I'm thinking, yeah, we already have an alternative, like a foundation for an alternative system, which is the neurodiversity movement, which is um, expanding. Uh, here we are now, right? But um, it needs to get bigger and stronger and penetrate these capitalist systems, toxic systems in academia everywhere, science. And I think we're doing that. We're, we're starting to influence them, uh, for me, in cognitive science and here locally in the Philippines. Uh, so I'm, I'm in touch with the, 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 my mentors are all the... the they, they started speech and language therapy here, and I have ties with um, uh, policymakers as well. Well, not as strong because of the political climate here now that the dictator, the tyrant of fascists won the election recently, which is traumatizing, uh, just recently recovering now. But I'm, I'm in touch with different, uh, with socialist groups now. So I think I'm a socialist now, maybe. Uh, so, uh, but it's tough because we're the minority and we're in this tyrannical system again. But we do what we can. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, I find consolation talking to uh, activists like you people with my next networks all around the world uh, and it feels uh, I don't feel that alone anymore and I think we can be stronger yeah and we need to look after each other because it's really tough and the, what Bruce said uh, the, the institutional trauma what, what you coined uh, I think that's that's very yeah, true yeah. In institutional neuralism where it's 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 the neurodiversity equivalent of institutional racism where it's like racism is discrimination against ethnic minorities whereas 
uh, neuralism is um, a, personally a term I prefer using over ableism because I think like neuralism is more precise and accurate in terms of like, this is discrimination based on neurology. Like the, um, the cool thing that I remember Jorn talking about and you know, his articles is, you know, things that again, go back to comparisons with, uh, um, I think it was Oliver Cromwell Cox, the black Marxist scholar, where he looked at how racism didn't really exist prior to capitalism and how in more modern um, times, Malcolm X in the 60s had a speech where he said, you can't have capitalism without racism. And I would say that similarly, just as in societies in ancient Roman nation, in ancient Greece, there, wa there was no racism in what we call primordial communist societies, prehistoric tribes or hunter-gatherer cultures, as you know, Jorn talks about, there was no neuralism because everyone was valued for what they had to contribute to the tribe. I mean, like humanity would not have survived without neurodivergent people. So I think it's wrong that they're uh, bashing us so hard, especially in these times. I mean, we're not gonna make it if we don't all do it together, you know, solidarity forever, that sort of thing. And if you have uh, written about that, I would be keen to read. Uh, so do share links to it. Or... Yeah, I wanted to. And that actually brings up a good point about, you know, the effects of neurological battle fatigue, the neurodiversity equivalent of racial battle fatigue. Like I would, I wanted to write an article on those very issues, those terms that I had coined for um, the uh, a call for papers for teaching sociology, a peer reviewed journal but I just didn't have the energy or the capacity to do it because it's like, how do you write a paper about institutional discrimination within academia and other institutions when coping with that drains you? Like you can't write about it if it's killing you. Mm -hmm. So what I basically did was just make a Twitter thread about it and said, okay, here are my terms. Now use them as tools as however you guys see fit. And so I, I think that's an important point that even Nick Walker brings up, where most of the imagination, most of the innovation actually happens outside of those very gatekeeped arenas. Yeah, uh, and this is I was going to say, I mean, our educational institutions are obviously culturally corrupted so um that's as you then point out uh, then needing to conform to the established silos of academia is effectively it's uh, stifling even what you can write and you have to um in many disciplines basically self-censor in order to get published so um that's why i'm well i'm not an academic um and i think the it's important to have non-academic um, ways of uh, advancing our movement. So anyone wants to, for example, and, and since the Autistic Collaboration Trust is about autistic collaboration, um, I think uh, I would, uh, yeah, anyone who wants to publish there uh, to further this movement and these types of goals is, is welcome to contribute. What I would really like to encourage, and I've started to do this, um, you know, um, this year, um, is to collaborate on articles because I think the more everything on the autistic collaboration website is an autistic collaboration, right? The more uh, effectively this concept uh, basically explains itself; it becomes self-evident and. This is, you know, pushing back against one of the most damaging, harmful stereotypes that is leveled against autistic people that we're not good at uh, collaborating that we, because we don't fit into society yet. We don't fit into those op oppressive systems, but uh, that doesn't mean that we're incapable of collaboration, right? So, um, so in recent months, you know, I um, co-authored a number of articles with Uki Muslim and, um, 
yeah, further collaborations are welcome. So um, I'm happy to co-author articles, but also between other autistic people, I think I'd be aiming to publish anything that has more than two autistic names to it and, you know, only autistic names. So um, now, does anyone want to add to this discussion further? I think Marie, uh, you uh, do you want to have further thoughts to impart on us uh, in view of the live sessions that will happen um, in the coming day? Uh, yeah, these these have, has been a great discussion, and I'd be keen to. Um, to know what the other perspectives are, because I know I don't know Tania Tanya that that I don't know. This yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, she has worked with um, former ABA therapists and somehow converted them to neurodivergent affirming practices. I don't know. So things like that. How how is that how is that accomplished or you know, mm -hmm. how hard was it? So things like that. So yeah. Very so, so, excited. Mm -hmm. Maybe this brings up a creative idea here. So I think since we've got this uh, panel here with basically people from all kinds of, well, all corners of the world, basically, right? Uh, I think I'm, I think we're covering all continents, uh, at least except Antarctica. I still have this thing. I, I need to dig up uh, an, uh, um, an autistic a researcher in Antarctica. We need that for just for complete coverage should be easy. Um, but um, maybe what one interesting outcome of all of this could be in whatever stage of discussion we'll reach as part of this session here uh, internationally, I think maybe that can catalyze uh, collaborations between all of us in terms of co-authoring articles to, to basically advance our thinking regarding the how question. How does that sound? Yeah, I'd be happy to do so, that. We need to do that, yes. And yeah, then absolutely. we can build on that. And so I think similar to what I've seen earlier this year with the you know um, um, global, um, hang on, I need to get the, the name right, the Global Autistic Task Force on Autism Research, we need more of these international collaborations where we advance the thinking of the neurodiversity movement, where we advance autistic culture, and then we can take that back into our lo local um, uh, societies and local environments. So what I'm trying to do here in Aotearoa is to uh, take all this international global autistic wisdom that exists out there, this lived experience, um, which because we are all marginalized locally. I mean, all of that autistic culture so far has largely been developed online, right? But it needs to find a physical manifestation in our respective countries, in our respective communities and cities. So that's why the Autistic Collaboration Trust, and we're trying to do this in a sort of embryonic form here in Aotearoa, is to establish things like um, centers of autistic culture, right? And we go into public libraries to educate people about just basic public education around the new diversity movement, the new diversity paradigm, and then autistic culture, because people simply don't know about that stuff, right? Um, the As we all know, the term new diversity has been co-opted, right, by big corporations. And it's being used for, well, for highly oppressive and marginalizing um, approaches to basically uh, exerting or extracting uh, economic utility out of autistic people, right? Uh, so that we can be, in quotes, harnessed by the system. Um, we need to push back against that. And I think so there's this important role of collaborating internationally and then finding ways of deploying this or taking it local and creating physical centers of autistic culture where people are free to be autistic um, and um, start creating physical presences of autistic culture and not only isolated autistic people. I think this is what's really, if I look across the autistic community, this is sort of what I sense is happening to many autistic people that, yeah, we have this peer support, 
um, internationally online, but then locally we find ourselves highly isolated. And that's maybe one topic that I think probably most of us can relate to, right? And I see this in your, you're all nodding, yeah. Okay, um, anyone wants to close with the last word? So I'll, I'll shut up now. Uh, I guess just I um, would like to again thank everyone who participated in this on such short notice and um, I I may have other things to tend to tomorrow so I don't I don't know for sure I don't think I'll be in the live sessions so I wanted to really prioritize coming here to speak with y'all um, right now um, if I'm not there tomorrow, uh, you know, especially shout out to uh, Alex Constant for um, founding the International Day of Protest Against ABA um, and all the other panelists who, um, you know, answered the call. I mean, this is, I think it's awesome that I was able to, um, you know, sort of shine the you know bat signal on on twitter and 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 get a, you know a, a response from people and say like hey some one of our one of our neurokin is in trouble and needs our support to you know um dismantle these systems and i think while we're doing this it's important that we include all neuro minority groups in these conversations as well, and not just autistic people, because that is a mistake that the queer movements made early in the day where you had the gay liberation movement. It was mostly middle-class white men. And um, it, so it didn't even include all gay people. It certainly didn't include um, le uh, lesbians. And it didn't even include bisexual or pansexual or asexual people. So when we talk about neurodivergent liberation moving forward, yes, autistic people should be central voices, but so should kinetic people, so should schizophrenic people, so should bipolar people, so should multidimensional people, that just everyone. And because um, we, we can't do it alone in isolation. We, we, we really do need a, we need all, we need all of the neuroqueer comrades at our disposal. Yeah, excellent, very good. So uh, I'll um, take this recording um, online, publish it um, on uh, the Art Collab uh, YouTube uh, channel, um, and it will be available then basically before the sessions tomorrow. So if people want to view this as an intro, it is gonna be available within the next um, few hours. I'll email you a link, Bruce. Um, and then, you know, even if you're not there tomorrow, I think in the beautiful virtual online world, we can make this happen as if you were available tomorrow. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. And I've got more questions here and thoughts. I'll weave those into the uh, session tomorrow. It will be a to our marathon with, uh, I think, two groups of people. So I've divided that into two groups. So that becomes, you know, uh, more manageable. I think, um, I mean, with the three of us or four people, it works. My experience is once you have more people than that, then panel discussions, um, they, yeah, they can sometimes lack depth. So I hope we are, we are finding a format here that will work. And I'm excited about collaborating on articles, right? And I don't even want to be part of all articles. I just invite autistic collaborations and let's uh, create a platform for autistic collaboration and liberation. Thanks I'm so much. Totally in on you with that, Jorn. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll collaborate onwards.